All right, I think we get going. So hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Futures Forum session on Net Zero. My name is Hannah. I'm going to be chairing the session today. And we've got a really amazing lineup of panelists. I'm looking forward to a really good discussion on the vision for Net Zero and what's currently happening across the UK. Before we get started, I want to run through a few points. So we're really keen to make the session as interactive as possible. So please feel free to ask questions via the Q&A box throughout. We'll definitely take some questions as we go along, and then we'll have some time at the end to answer more questions as well. We're also going to throw up a couple of polls where we want to hear about you know, your background, your field of study, and some of your views on the net zero transition. So please do get voting um, when they pop up. Uh, we're using the hashtag RUKFuturesForum um, for this event, so feel free to use that if you're posting uh, about this at all. And I also want to thank our headline sponsors who are Ørsted, um, Siemens Gamisa Renewable Energy, Dogger Bank, Wind Farm and Vattenfall, so thanks to them for making this possible. And with that out of the way, um, let me introduce myself first and then I'll go over to our panel of speakers. So as I said before, my name is Hannah, I work for a company called Natural Power. Um, we're a renewable energy consultancy, so I head up a team of engineers and project managers across Europe who help people with the development, um, construction and financing of wind farms, solar farms and other clean energy and storage projects. So that might mean anything from working with a local council to figure out if they can put solar panels on their buildings to help reduce their carbon footprint, to working with a bank who are you know, getting them comfortable with lending hundreds of millions of pounds to huge wind farm development. I'm also a member of Renewable UK's Shadow Board, which is something they set up last year to give people like myself, who are still relatively early on in their careers, a chance to really understand how an industry organisation like Renewable UK works and what it means to be on a board. So um, thanks also to Renewable UK uh, for making that possible. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Eleanor first to introduce herself and then we'll go around from there. So Eleanor, over to you. Hello, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm, I'm here representing the rural economy, uh, which is absolutely at the, at the heart of net zero because it's where all the stuff comes from. Um, and I'm, um, I'm on my way back from a, um, a renewable regenerative agriculture conference. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm out here in nature. You might see a rabbit in the background if you're lucky. Um, but um, hopefully my Wi-Fi will hold up. Um, and I want to, to give you a bit of a flavour of why what the what the rural economy is, why it's so important to net zero, and um, how you could get involved in it, um, which is something I've done not too long ago. Um, so, if we're looking at a circular, a net zero circular economy, one of the fundamental points of that is about producing commodities from regenerative systems, which means we have to grow it. We can't dig it out of the ground. So we need the land to produce food, but we also need it to produce green construction materials, green packaging, green energy, um, and many green jobs. Uh, well, many green jobs are about using the resources we've already got in a more efficient or more circular way. What excites me about the rural economy is it's the starting point. It's where the green wealth is actually produced. Um, so uh, industries like agriculture, forestry, aquaculture, um, my notes are blowing around. Uh, horticulture, garden, su uh, nursery supplies, primary um, timber and food processing. Um, these, are, these are really the foundation of the net zero economy. Um, down the supply chain, these things appear as scope three emissions uh, or embodied carbon. And they're often, people are a bit late to get onto the case of them, but they're, they're really coming up the agenda as we tackle um, energy more effectively, scope three emissions from production of the coming um, absolutely key to reaching net zero. We also need the land to do other things. We need it to sequester carbon and to reverse biodiversity decline. Um, it's, uh, so we're storing peatlands, expanding forests, reducing soil erosion, soaking up flood water, um, making space for wildlife on our very crowded islands, creating little um, wildlife havens like this one that I've discovered around the back of the service station. Um, these things need um, need done we need our cities to be healthier and greener and cooler um, and that's all part of a net zero that's 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 economic activity it doesn't just happen by itself so we need the land to produce the stuff we need and we need nature to be restored at the same time um, and that means we need to be really smart and professional about how we use the land um, and so what kind of people do this well we need 
We need gamers to roll out the smart precision technology, robotics, GIS mapping. Um, drones are becoming vital in the rural economy. Smartphone apps that enable farmers and foresters to monitor change in real time and in precise detail. Loads of technology. We need the scientists to give us the data and innovation, the ecologists to provide surveys, chemists to analyze soil carbon, inventors to give us a way to, um, to do diesel free farm machinery um, or grow hydroponic salad from a solar powered tower on top of a supermarket. We need the hot fuzz to keep us right. We need the government regulators to investigate the pollution incidents and to protect our biosecurity and to ensure the right trees planted in the right place. And we also need independent auditors who certify the sustainability labels like organic FSC, uh, leaf mark, and also the zero carbon accreditation. And we need the visionaries, and this is kind of what I've got into. We need the strategies and the consultants, the communicators, the economists, the managers to bring clear insight into the wicked problems of how do we do 15 different things with one piece of land? How do we change an established system to a, a new and better one? Um, and to help the farmers and the foresters and the politicians and the consumers understand where we need to get to and how. Um, and the rewards are huge. Um, the rewards are more nature, more sequestered carbon and um, greener products, um, producing everything we need from our daily lives. So um, just um, perhaps should have done this at the start, but here am I. I'm not from a farming background. Um, I'm a city girl. I studied history and my natural habitat is a library. Um, but since primary school, really, I've longed to find the key to restoring nature. Um, and I met a forester by chance um, while I was thinking I was going to be a historian. Um, and I heard about how foresters design and create new forests to create to grow carbon negative construction material and create um, carbon negative buildings while also at the same time you can create have habitat for biodiversity. And I thought, this is it. This is what I want to be doing. Um, I want to be part of this. So I became policy researcher for the forestry industry um, using my, my writing skills and my research skills um, and absorbing knowledge. Um, and now I work as natural capital and carbon leader um, for Galbraith, who are a company who manage farms and forests all across the UK, and they're helping to drive the kind of transformation I described. Um, so there's, there are many different routes to careers in the countryside, and mine shows that you don't have to have a farming or a forestry degree, um, although those are very useful. Lots of people come in through a labouring job, such as tree planting or tractor driving, um, and there's lots of those available. And in expanding areas like forestry, there are very strong opportunities for career development um, and promotion on the job into professional roles. Um, and there's also, there's a wide range of graduate traineeships in public and private sectors, which give you a really structured um, route into, into these professions. Um, if, you're, if you're curious and innovative and passionate about net zero and biodiversity in the rural economy, you'll very much find yourself in the company of like-minded people. Um, since I've met that forester 10 years ago, I've met more inspirational people than I can count. Um, I've just had the last two days at this festival talking to uh, farmers and agronomists about, um, about all new varieties of wheat and different ways of uh, creating farming dairy, all kinds of things. Apologies, there's noise in the background. So I'll finish. I hope I've sparked your interest and um, please do ask me questions or get in touch either. Um, afterwards um, or just now um, if there's anything that you'd like to find out more about. Brilliant. Thanks, Eleanor. And we'll definitely have more time at the end to talk about kind of career paths and, and want to find out then what, what you're, you're studying at the moment as well in the audience. I'm going to move on to Lauren uh, next. Lauren, can you tell us a bit about yourself and, and your work? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Hannah. And great to be here today with the other panellists. And I've just learned loads from Eleanor just then about a whole industry that I didn't know about. So um, Hopefully I can tell you a little bit more about me and maybe you've not heard of it before either. So um, my name's Lauren and I'm a stakeholder advisor for the Humber region for Orsted and I'm based out of something called the East Coast Hub in Grimsby um, in normal times, but I'm at home at the moment. We're the global leader in offshore wind energy and the UK is our largest market for offshore wind. We have 12 operational offshore wind farms. Um, and from the East Coast, we're operating a wind farm called Hornsey One, which is actually the largest wind farm in the world. 
but not for long because if I stepped five minutes outside my front door to the beach, I'd see turbines heading out to Hornsey too, which is its sister project that we're also constructing. So I've worked for Orsted for three years and can safely say it's my dream job, as cliche as it is, but I knew whatever I did in my career, I wanted to make a difference in my hometown of Grimsby. And I absolutely loved geography and learning about the world. I headed up to Newcastle University in 2012 to study geography and I had my moment. I found my passion. Before then, I didn't know what exactly I wanted to do. We had a lecture on how offshore wind is transforming places around the UK. So it's really fitting that I'm here today on a people and places panel. Um, in 2014, I wrote my dissertation on how offshore wind was transforming Grimsby and offering new opportunities to our community and how our journey began here. And what I learned was that back then it was geographical proximity to the market. So we're really close to the wind farms uh, geographically, the infrastructure we already had, the support from local institutions like councils and businesses, and that helped the industry grow in the early days. So now as we re reflect on nearly 10 years of offshore wind in Grimsby, we're seeing thousands of jobs. We have over 400 in Orsted alone, and most of those are local. We've got apprentices coming through that are male and female. We've already had our first qualified technicians. Um, the largest operations and maintenance hub in the world, when I um, interviewed what was Dong Energy at the time and um, my company's former name and when I was doing my dissertation I visited them in two porter cabins on a gravel car park. Now it is the world's largest operations and maintenance hub and it is has been likened to Thunderbirds HQ so that was back in 2014 so it shows the pace of the industry. We've got SOVs coming in so big hotel vessels and um, giant ones that say Grimsby on the side of them they're coming in and out of the port of Grimsby, followed by a fleet of CTV, so smaller vessels, and we've got helicopters overhead. We've got a growing supply chain from the Siemens Blade factory up the river um, to the huge variety of local suppliers that support the operations and maintenance of offshore wind farms day to day and the supply of goods, services, training and lots more. There's multi billions, not millions, billions of pounds invested in this place with much more still to come. And most importantly, offshore wind is changing the identity of Grimsby. So from the world's premier fishing port, which my family have worked in for generations, to the world's leading operations and maintenance hub for offshore wind. We're at the forefront of fighting climate change and central to the government's net zero mission. So there's certainly a buzz about the town once again. And in my job, that's all I get to talk about all day long. So I feel very lucky. Brilliant. Thank you, Lauren. And then finally, we've got Henry on the panel. Um, so same question, really, Henry. <laughs> Tell us a bit about yourself. Lovely to be here. Thanks so much. And it's great to be here with uh, Lauren as well, uh, who obviously uh, is very much involved in one of the parts of the North that we're really focused on. So uh, I run something called the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. I'm its inaugural kind of permanent director. So we were set up to kind of drive forward the Northern economy. Um, and clearly a big part of that is the transition to net zero. So whether it's the uh, factory the blade factory at hull that lauren mentioned or the other parts of that supply chain clearly there's two ways of thinking about the environmental transition clearly it's an absolute imperative for our society it's also a key part of the government's leveling up agenda most of the uk's electricity has been made in places away from london the southeast in the north of england we generate almost half of england's electricity not not half of the people live here so we export electricity historically and we used to make it uh, or produce it in uh, lovely uh, coal-fired power stations. We also used to dig up that coal. Uh, we don't do that anymore here in the north of England. We do very very limited amounts of it. Um, and big facilities like Drax uh, that used to run on coal now run on biomass and in many cases are looking to go carbon negative uh, using technology like carbon capture use and storage. So we work across all of the renewable energy sector. We also work in transport where decarbonisation is a huge issue and a huge opportunity, uh, whether that's electrification of rail or the deployment of hydrogen uh, as an alternative fuel in areas where uh, electrification is either very difficult or too expensive. And we also work extensively uh, on some of those wider social and economic challenges that have an environmental dimension. So air quality in cities is absolutely uh, dependent on our metro mayors to challenge that and to deal with that along with local government. Um, and we work very closely with those elected politicians as well as with business across the north of England. Uh, so I'm really lucky uh, to have got to what I do now. I, I started off 
at doing a variety of things in politics and in local government. So I was the cabinet member for quality of life at Newcastle City Council, where I was responsible for the environment, but also for housing, transport policy uh, and culture initially, uh, as well as a number of other areas. Um, and I think what's interesting is just how integrated environmental questions are in the wider public policy agenda. So clearly there are lots of businesses that are, like or said, absolutely focused on net zero, but every single business in the UK now has to think about its environmental and social obligations. Many businesses that were historically big carbon emitters are re-emerging re from that and, and reshaping their business models. So whether a company sounds green um, or, or sort of is defined by being green, the reality is that the jobs in those organisations are changing in front of our very eyes. Um, and we also work in some technologies that are less popular with lots of people. So we do lots of work on the nuclear sector, which is a big part of the northern economy. There's a big arc that stretches from West Cumbria down through uh, uh, the fuels places that we, we produce fuels from in the north of England at Springfield, which is operated uh, there on a nuclear license site, right down to Warrington, uh, the home of Birchwood, where many of the back office and support services are, right through to North Wales, uh, where you have key facilities and uh, a number of license sites that are suitable for new build technology like on Anglesey. So the environmental and the net zero agenda isn't all full of stuff that everyone agrees with. Some of these are hard social and policy choices. Some of them are difficult economic choices. Uh, to what extent do we need to have large amounts of base load? Uh, whatever you want to call it these days, there's lots of fashionable terms for it. Um, and also, to what extent can the country uh, make no regrets decisions now? So there are lots of technologies and important things that are going to come along down the way. And one of the biggest questions that the government and businesses have to answer is how much can we and should we invest now and how much should we leave? And if you want to achieve your net zero targets that have been set, not just in this country, but around the world, it's very hard to keep waiting and waiting. And many of our local places and city regions around the north have got much more ambitious climate change targets than central government. So Andy Burnham, for instance, in Greater Manchester has a target that's much more ambitious. Many other cities have more ambitious targets as well, uh, including cities like Sheffield. So one of the real opportunities and challenges is to what extent can places lead this agenda, but also how do they put detail and real structure behind their plans and not just necessarily uh, talk about climate change, but actually do some of it in practice. And there's a key role both for the public and the private sector in the north of England, we're very lucky to be leading on much of that agenda. So although I, my job and my role crosses over a variety of policy areas and a variety of issues, I do a huge amount of work in this space. And I suppose I'm the person here whose job isn't all about net zero, uh, but it, it defines almost all the things I do and all the projects I work on, because whether it's around rebalancing research and development investment, or whether it's around how we deal with towns that may have been left behind, and Grimsby is a great example of a place that has changed so much in the last 10 years and has recaptured probably some of its glory from its history uh, as a great place that had an economic purpose. And the reality is that net zero uh, often produces jobs and opportunities in places where those have been lacking uh, in the last few decades. And that includes many communities here in the north of England. So it's a pleasure to be with you today and really look forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks, Henry. And I think, you know, you, you raise a really important point, which is net zero is such a big vision and it's so challenging and so ambitious and it's great that you know our government in the UK and other governments have embraced that now as a target but how do we turn that target into a reality there's so much that needs to happen so on that note I have a poem for you um, Emma and Vicky if you could maybe bring that up I want to know what do you, you know, personally see as the biggest challenge in reaching net zero in the UK so you know you might think it's it's about the political will and we need politicians to be more ambitious and to make decisions and drive this. It might be around technology and just the fact that we don't have all the solutions yet. It might be around people and what you know how we live our lives and, and what change needs to happen to get to net zero. If you put other, which please do if you, if you have another idea, please put in, in the Q&A what you think that other is so we can discuss that as well. So we'll leave this open for a bit. There's a second poll around what you're studying, which we're also really interested to find out because you know as um, our panelists touched on, there are lots of different pathways into net zero and it's definitely not all about being an engineer for example so please get voting we'll leave this up for a minute or two and then we'll come back to it but in the meantime you know all of, all of you on the panel have really already touched on this that net zero is such a big all-encompassing goal that really touches on all parts of our economy and all parts of our society so if you could maybe comment on specifically in your job, how does that play a part in the net zero transition? And where do you see the biggest challenge at the moment 
you know, what is the biggest block right now, the way you see it in your job to get to net zero? Um, so again, Eleanor, I'm going to start with you. Right. Uh, well, I've got I've got natural capital and carbon in my title, so yeah, I've, I've, it's it's all about net zero. And um, the um, one of the things about the rural economy is, um, like every other sector, it's a case of um, we're an industry, we're where we are. We've got lots of carbon emissions, and we need to get them um, down to net zero. And what's different is that we're not just using energy or um, just driving cars or just heating buildings. We're doing a lot more complicated things. So we've got cattle that emit a lot of methane, and that's a difficult problem. Do you just stop eating meat, stop producing cattle, or can you uh, can you actually use um, pasture-fed cattle to tackle some of the problems, um, create biodiversity habitat? But then how do you um, tackle the methane emissions? We've got trees which um, sequester carbon, which is amazing. We've got um, the only the only large-scale functioning um, carbon capture and storage facility available, but um, managing trees um, is a whole art in itself, um, silviculture and, and what, what kind of trees and where. Um, and we've got fertilizer and nitrates, that's a, another big um, component of farming carbon emissions are, um, are fertilizers, and we've absolutely come to rely on them over the last um, half century for producing the amount of food that we need to eat. Um, how can we reduce them? How can we relearn um, some of the, the old farming techniques? Um, how can we use land more efficiently? Um, how can we use um, new technologies like robotics to target rather than just spraying fertilizer everywhere? You actually, you target exactly where you want it. So that's the interesting thing about the rural economy. If we've got these massive opportunities like tree planting, peatland restoration is another one. Um, you can do so much good for carbon and biodiversity. Um, by, by tackling these issues. Um, we've got the whole of the rest of the economy wanting to invest in us. We've got this um, corporates everywhere saying we want to um, capture carbon and we want to decarbonize our supply chains. But then we've got this really quite fiddling um, thing going on of these quite, um, in the UK, we have quite small farms um, and this very diverse uh, land use, different types of carbon emissions and every problem is a really complicated one. So that's the barrier is how do you, you know, you can't just throw big money at the problem. You need to throw intelligent money at the problem and not enough people understand what we're doing. So that's, um, that's my focus is, is, is getting people to, uh, to understand and to try to find ways through these really complicated multi-layered problems. And it's, it's, I see my role as very much a shift from uh, you produce food, you produce commodities and you get paid some government subsidy along the way to kind of keep it going to um, a real stack of income. So you might, you might be producing food, but you might be producing it with a premium for being low carbon. You might be producing timber as well for low carbon buildings. You might be doing some carbon offsets. You might be doing some biodiversity offsets and you might be working with a water company to be producing cleaner water for the catchment downstream. So you end up with this um, multi-layer stack. So we're going from simple to complicated and that's, that's our challenge, but it's also what makes it really interesting. That's a really nice way of putting it. I guess it's a whole mindset shift behind that about um, you know how people use their resources and to embrace that complexity really, because I guess it also provides protection that you're less exposed to an individual area as a way to make money, but you, you know you have a bit of a wider remit. Lauren, what's it like for you? Would you also say that that sort of added complexity is a factor or do you see different challenges in, in the kind of renewable generation world? Um. I guess it's it's hard to put, put your finger on, but um, I guess what we'd say about offshore wind is that it's been hugely supported. So um, nationally, by national government in the targets that they set. So um, we're around about 10 gigawatts offshore wind today, but we need to get to four gigawatts by 2030. So we've got the, the rate at which we develop our projects has got to obviously increase significantly. Um, the industry has moved on, we've learned loads. So obviously those first offshore wind farms back in the day, uh, you know, 2006, seven, they were, you know, really small offshore wind farms and now we're building the wind farms that are furthest from shore. The scale of them is huge. Um, they rival the, you know, a normal conventional power station, the cost is reduced and um, there's huge innovation, but we still need to get those projects through the planning stages. And that's something that we have to do. And I think I'll touch on that later as well in terms of careers. It might be not something that you've recognised, but um, 
these need to go through planning permission like as you kind of would hear maybe parents talk about a house these have to have planning permission too even in the seabed so it's getting those projects through and we have a few projects right now that we are developing so that's really positive that they've got a pipeline of projects um a little bit maybe about the um people we need people to work for us we know that we're going to have a shortage of engineers um and a shortage of of people working in skills that are transferable across sectors so there's a lot of investment in offshore wind but there's also a lot of investment in other sectors um not related to offshore wind but also the other decarbonizing sectors or um other national infrastructure projects that need health and safety managers project managers and all of those skills that are, they're quite transferable we're going to be kind of competing with those we're also seeing new offshore wind markets just open up across the world because um we as a world need to actually take action um against climate change so we can't forget that the kind of people challenge in there right now it feels okay but the scale and the pace of the industry is huge and rapid so we need to make sure that we are bringing young people on the journey they're in school that they're learning about green jobs and net zero climate change really early on what it means to be an engineer and know that it's not just climbing up a turbine or dealing with greasy bolts and you you know you're not just a male that does that you know there's a whole industry out there and there's a whole variety of jobs so diversity and people and getting our projects through is really important to us Great, thanks Lauren. And we actually just had a, a question from someone who used to work in a co-fired power plant. So a big part of that transition and, and shifting people is also about providing job opportunities for people who have trained in fossil fuel sectors where jobs are going to disappear over yeah. time because we have to um, shift away from those those types of projects. And I know it's something that the renewables industry in the UK is very focused on that just transition and providing that retraining and, and job opportunities. Absolutely. Henry, um, in your you know you've touched on i think the complexity of how how do you do net zero at a regional level what does that mean how does it influence transport and the way we live and all of those things so what where do you see the biggest challenges in in kind of the overall net zero vision i think one of the issues is that there are there are really some really difficult things to do so decarbonizing heat is really difficult so uh i think a lot of people often reduce uh kind of everything to kind of well, we, we just need to decarbonize electricity, but electricity on its own is a relatively small part of the problem. Now, actually, you need lots of then green electricity for most of the other solutions, right? So it's not, it's not that electricity doesn't matter, but I think people sometimes in the public think that that's the only challenge and it, it sadly isn't. There's lots of other things that are really difficult and, and hard to un unpick. And, and people often don't think about, some of the shifts are about the problems we have with our wider infrastructure as much as they are specific zero carbon challenges so we're really reliant on lorries to travel around the country moving our stuff lorries are really hard to decarbonize if we use more rail freight it will be a lot easier because electrifying rail lines is a lot easier than coming up with a solution for wagons uh, so you can build hydrogen trucks right it's just not very easy <laughs> so i think there's a kind of a i think what i would say is that the UK has massively underestimated what we need in terms of wider infrastructure and that actually makes the shift to net, net zero more difficult in many sectors um, because you're not just fixing a decarbonisation problem you're also dealing with some underlying problems which we've dealt with through really carbon intensive short-term solutions but if you're going to fix those problems in the long term you also need to fix the underlying problems as well so I'd say decarbonising heat is the kind of that's the big challenge and like nobody in the UK really makes makes heat pumps so as much as I love a heat pump they're quite expensive and I'm a great believer that we need to be making the stuff we're going to use so the blade factory that Lauren mentioned is a particular favorite of mine it was one of the first places I went when I took this job uh, and Jürgen Meyer who was then the chief exec of Siemens showed myself and George Osborne around uh, George Osborne had been the chancellor at the time when that plant was built and had helped make it happen um, and I suppose I very quickly understood the scale of the prize uh, on the Humber around what we could do around more supply chain and we're really excited that we're going to be expanding the facilities on the south bank of the Humber with support from the government so that we can provide more of the capacity that Lauren and her colleagues need along with the rest of the industry to be able to keep those jobs in the UK because when we first started building offshore wind in the UK we relied far too much on other parts of Europe to supply that and to build many of the components um, and what I think Allstead have done that's so impressive is despite the fact that maybe the UK was quite slow to really capture the benefits of what we were doing, 
the the support and the supply of spares and the maintenance of wind farms has turned out to be a much more important industry than building them. <laughs> so although we were slow off the mark in the UK at developing that UK capacity and UK content, absolutely we've been incredible at maintaining and servicing them. And actually you can be sat in Grimsby and I'm sure Lauren will tell us much better than I am, monitoring a wind turbine in China. And it doesn't matter that you're in Grimsby. As lovely as it is to be in Grimsby, you could be anywhere. The wind farm you're looking after could be anywhere in the world. And once you develop those skills to look after wind turbines and optimize them and get the most out of them as an asset, you can deploy those skills pretty much anywhere in the world. And we're trying to do the same thing, right, with other industries. So the UK has spent a fortune building a new nuclear power plant down in the south of England at, uh, with our colleagues from EDF. And it's a great ambition to do that. But building sort of one off big nuclear power stations, as important as it is to replace grid capacity that we might be losing, is incredibly expensive. We want to find cheaper, more replicable ways in the nuclear industry to deploy. And we've had some really difficult times in the north of England trying to deliver big projects. We had a really important project in West Cumbria that will have generated a huge amount of employment and electricity as well at Moorside. That fell through uh, despite the efforts of myself and many others. And, and I suppose what I'd say is, this journey isn't all positive, easy, like sort of like just kind of going with the groove. Do you mean like there's a lot of times when this is really hard stuff to do and finding the money, private and public, to make this work is not simple either. These are expensive investment projects and uh, deploying them at scale is really challenging. So we we think that that developing technologies that are replicable and have UK content is really important. So building small modular reactors isn't just about creating some jobs in West Cumbria, as much as I'd love to do that. It's a place that definitely needs them. It's also about the people who work at Forge Masters in Sheffield, who work in the defence supply chain predominantly, but are a huge part of the future supply chains we need to build for very big wind turbines, because the stuff that Lauren's colleagues keep building is getting bigger and bigger. So the technology and the places you build it are changing because you need different facilities for the future. And what's interesting is that many parts of the net zero story share the same backstory. So what you actually need to transition to net zero isn't just lots of ideas of what sort of stuff you want to put, lots of kit. You also need to be able to make that stuff and then go around the world and help other people to make it at a cost they can afford. Because the real joy of the story of offshore wind has been the reduction in price. And that is the other challenge. So yes, you can have lots of whiz bang technologies and I love a tidal barrage as much as the next person, but they ain't going to happen unless we can make sure we can do the first one at reasonable price and the second and third ones are affordable. And certainly small modular reactors have had to wait in the UK, despite the enthusiasm for them, until UKSMR Consortium and others can get the price down for the first fleet of them. So you want to be deploying a fleet of them the same way we've put a fleet of offshore wind turbines off the coast of the north of the country. We also need to be putting out fleets of other in interventions. Doing lots and lots of different things to tackle net zero doesn't really work. Having a hydrogen economy in one city but not in another makes it very hard for you to drive your hydrogen bus or van any further than just around the corner. And so I think what you need is coordination around the right areas and in things like strategic transport. That means coordination across a much wider area. And when it comes to our electricity system, remember so much of this investment is coming from the private sector, not the public. So how you give the private sector the incentives to invest and as Lauren says, how you provide the, the talent they need, so the skills to be able to grow, is really important. And so I suppose those of us who are responsible for the, the, the North's economic positioning are absolutely here to support businesses like Orsted and their supply chains. That's our role. And to make sure that government thinks through the implications of wider industrial policy, wider policy for our towns and cities, so that they understand the needs of business for these bigger challenges, that they don't sort of think, oh, that business is in Grimsby, right? In reality, that supply chain stretches a long way across the UK and the whole of the UK's communities, local government, the government in Westminster, the devolved administrations in Scotland and Wales all need to play their part in making the conditions right to be able to make those industries thrive. Yeah, and I think a really important factor there is just speed, right? Like if we want to get to net zero by 2050 and you have some local authorities that are saying by 2030, we can't really afford to spend ages and ages just figuring out what is exactly the perfect solution at some point we just have to get on and, and do it but as you said there's lots that that needs to happen you know in terms of policy in terms of support in terms of skills to very build up that speed um, that we can decarbonize right i'm interested in the poll responses um because we did ask you what what do you think is the biggest challenge in in reaching net zero so ooh, all will be revealed we've got actually mostly behavioral change and then a lot on political will as well 
um, and then actually less on technology. I think that kind of echoes what what Henry was maybe saying about, you know, particularly on technology with when it comes to decarbonizing electricity, we are doing really well. You know, we've got wind, we've got solar, we've got batteries now, but we need to start thinking about things like heat decarbonization. And that's maybe something that isn't so much discussed in the public yet. But that's also a behavioral change thing because we all individually, you know, heat our homes, the places we live. And so when it comes to changing that, there's going to be much more involvement from individual families and, and households than if it's a decision to put a big offshore wind farm and, and swap that out for a coal power plant. So I think you know, these all link together and then, you know, on the political will, um, I'm, I'm a climate campaigner <laughs> in my spare time. So I've spent a lot of time uh, speaking to my local council, you know, looking at national campaigns and things are definitely you know, changing fast. And I think um, pressure from young people, you know, from the Fridays for Future movement, from, you know, university divestment campaigns, from, you know, movements like Extinction Rebellion are obviously having a, a huge impact and we need that pressure to continue to make sure the governments are held to account on those targets and it's not enough just to say oh we'll get to net zero by 2050 they actually have to do the things that are needed to get us there the second poll what people are studying so we do have loads of people in stem subjects which is great i'm a physicist so i love to see that <laughs> but then also a good few people on social sciences humanities and you know other subjects or maybe you know non-university careers so i wanted um maybe to specifically ask Lauren um, about you know that sort of non-engineering pathways into renewables and you know we want to leave time for questions as well so if I can ask you to very quickly maybe talk about that and the certain kind of jobs um, that, that you see for people who don't have a STEM background but are needed in the wider energy sector or in the, in the clean energy sector. Yeah absolutely so um, what I would say is that the companies are like like Or said they are massive companies and I remember when I wanted to work at all said it was dong energy at the time wanted to work in offshore wind just thought it wasn't for me thought i had to climb a turbine and get on a boat and go offshore you'll never find me on a boat because i really don't like boats but it doesn't mean that the offshore wind sector isn't for me i get to talk about my passion every day i love geography i love making a difference i'm a good communicator use my skills to do that job we need people to do that job in lots of companies, we need people to tell the stories about that company. So we've got media and relations managers, stakeholder advisors like me, and we've got even people that do graphic design. I've had people come up to me at careers fairs and say, I'm really artistic and creative. Well, actually, we need people to do our social media, create our wonderful websites and graphics that tell the story of our transition as a company. Um, we need lawyers. People come up to me and say, Mm, yeah, I'm going in a law career, so it's kind of that way. So um, probably not relevant to have a conversation with you. These are huge, huge nationally significant infrastructure projects. We need lawyers. We also need people that love business, that we've had that as well. People that manage our finances, people that look at our projects and make sure that they are the biggest and best value projects right now. I think what advice I'd give is try and figure out, um, well, follow your passion, you know, the subjects that you love. I followed my passion for geography, not necessarily this like perfect round career route at the end of it where, you know, you study medicine, you become a doctor. It's not really quite like that, but I followed my passion. And I found the area that I wanted to go into. So find that kind of subject that you like, you will then find something in there that you enjoy in that and it's a career. Um, think about what you're interested in, as, you know, as a person, are you interested in being hands-on, fixing things, you interested in making a difference, climate change, sustainability as a whole, getting to know how things work or communicating with people. What skills do you have? I actually love working in teams. I'd like to work independently or I'd like to work across the globe or I'd like to work in the UK. When you start to hone these things down, you can start to see the routes you go down. We are a huge company, as many are in the field and in the UK there will be different jobs. Don't think that it ends that, you know, if you don't want to be an engineer, that's the end of your journey. And what I would say also is that we kind of need green jobs. It's not just that green jobs are this special little group of jobs over here. Green and net zero and tackling climate change is going to be in, in all sectors in everything that we do going forward. Absolutely. And we've got a question here from the audience um, saying, could we discuss some of the routes into public policy work? Henry, would you be able to take that one? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, a bit of a dark art, really. And I mean, a lot of people come via kind of an interest in politics and public policy. So that doesn't mean necessarily working. I work for a political party, uh, but a lot of people 
go and work for the civil service. Does that make sense? That's also a great place to get some of those skills. I would uh, also say that um, there are great agencies and organisations that provide great pathways and apprenticeships into these sectors now, and not just for people who uh, have been to university. So I know that we've got a lot of university uh, attendees on this chat, but please don't, when you're talking to friends and family, don't think that people have to follow the same route you might have gone going to university to get into those sorts of careers. Absolutely isn't the case anymore. It probably was 10, 15 years ago, but absolutely it's changed. Um, and I think that one of the things I would really emphasise is also that some of the routes into local government. So don't forget that there are, in the north of England, other parts of the country, in, in the west of England, in uh, the West Midlands, in Cambridge and Peterborough, uh, combined authorities as well as local government. Uh, and there are some incredible policy roles now, not just in London. So I think a lot of people think they have to move to London to work in these fields. Um, and you don't really do not have to do that. It does not work like that. So it really would encourage people, regardless of where you live in the country, not just to think about a linear career path to do with going to university or getting an MA or whatever. Uh, I went and sort of did my political apprenticeship, which is not, it's not like a proper apprenticeship, but I did a, a, a year as a sabbatical officer in a student organisation in the student movement before I got a proper job work for the Labour Party as a permanent member of staff. I learned more about public policy in my one year uh, doing it for real than I ever would have done through my degree, which was in sort of politics and sociology. Um, but there were lots of people who get into what I do and many others do in this space who have not necessarily got, got functionally related degrees either. So absolutely don't think that, and also it's not just for people who do it first career, right? There's a lot more people now in public policy work who are switching from industry or switching from other parts of uh, applied sort of social practice. So people who've worked in education for a long time are really good at education policy. It's a kind of a good thing. I mean, you want people with real life experience of some of these challenges making some of these decisions. And in uh, clearly in the net zero space, there are huge opportunities. Brilliant. Thanks, Henry. And I think the final question we have up here is again for Lauren, whether um, to looking at procurement specialists and, and the need for that in the industry. I mean, I can probably say that I spoke to Ursa's procurement team uh, just the other week, so I know that they have one. And it's a big, uh, a big, you know, pretty much every you know, company who deals with procurement has to have procurement specialists. But uh, anything you, you want yeah, to say definitely. on that, Lauren? We're a really big company, so we need um, specialists in procurement and like um, Henry says that it's not just all in London, we do have these specialists that are coming out into the regions now. Um, I know it sounds um, like I'm kind of pushing you aside, but um, our careers portal genuinely is updated all the time with new job roles. Um, so please do have a look. It isn't a kind of a dead end. There is loads of job roles on there updated all the time. We're a grown business. So please take a look. Brilliant. Well, I think that kind of leaves us to, to wrap this up. So, um, you know, please, please do get in touch, you know, if, if you want to follow up with any of the panellists, I'm sure they'd all be happy to, you know, to answer any follow up questions if you have them. Uh, I just want to say, you know, thanks to all the speakers, thanks to the organisers, thanks to our sponsors. And thank you, of course, for, for you guys in the audience for, for listening in and for answering uh, the polls and asking really good questions. Um, I think the next session is at 4.25, where we'll have uh, Rebecca Williams from Global Wind Energy Council talking about UK leadership ahead of COP26, which is going to be a huge moment this year. And I think all of us working in the industry are really excited that it's happening in the UK. It's a chance to kind of showcase where the UK is doing well, but also really to put the pressure on uh, you know, policymakers and governments to, to go even further. Uh, there are also some upcoming webinars. Next one's on the 15th of July, another session on the Net Zero Vision. And we'll also be running more events in September at the Global Offshore Wind Conference. I believe you'll also be sent a feedback survey. So please do fill that in. Let us know um, what you liked, if there's anything you didn't like. And uh, on a final point, I am told to advise you this webinar will be recorded or has been recorded. So um, just so you're aware of that as well. Great. Well, leave it at that. Thanks very much. Um, into the rest of our afternoon. and. Uh, Bye from my side. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>